Well, greetings and welcome to Deer Island. If you saw our last program on the geology of this area, you know that this show involves a great deal of walking. I can see that many of you already have your sneakers on and are ready to go, so let's get started. This program is going to be about the first known human inhabitants of this area, the Indians of Winthrop, and especially of Deer Island. As we boldly march forward on this hike, you'll notice that what I say about the first inhabitants is not always so sure-footed. That's because the initial occupants of this area were somewhat obscure. Apparently, the original inhabitants were the so-called red paint people. Graves have been found in Maine with their skeletons dyed red and with pots of red pigment buried close beside. Archaeological evidence suggests that the red paint people were pushed out or exterminated by a nation of small statued aborigines who occupied the northeastern section of this continent. Very likely the more familiar Indians in turn pushed out these small people. Slowly the Indians made their way down the Pacific coast going southward until they came into conflict with the tribes of Mexico. The tide of red Indians turned left and came eastward into the great Mississippi Basin. There they moved north as well as east and finally a portion of them occupied the Northeast. Next we must consider the writings and artifacts of the Norsemen. There is significant archaeological evidence of their presence in this area, especially in the state of Maine. I'm told there are also written records where the Norsemen tell of the fighting quality and strength and numbers of the Indians. Armed with swords, the Vikings were the best fighting men in Europe. If the Vikings did come and were defeated, it is probably because the Indians overwhelmed the Norsemen by sheer force of numbers and thus extinguished their colony or colonies. If you're not an archaeologist and don't speak French or Spanish, you may believe that the first encounters of Massachusetts Indians with Europeans occurred in 1497 when John Cabot sailed in these waters. John Cabot was an Italian navigator who came to Bristol, England when he was about 50 years old. His Italian name of Giovanni Cabato became shortened to the English style John Cabot after he lived in Bristol. Spain and Portugal were not interested in Cabot's proposed adventures, so he went to England where King Henry VII granted, granted Cabot letters patent to discover and claim a new world. In May of 1497, Cabot left Bristol on his ship, the Matthew, and sailed west with the intention of finding China or Japan. Instead, he discovered the new found lands, which we now know, of course, as Newfoundland, Canada. After anchoring his ship off the coast of this new land, he rode ashore and planted a cross, the banners of King Henry VII of England, also the Pope, and of St. Mark, the patron saint of Venice. He and his companions then set sail south, traveling over 900 miles down the east coast of North America, perhaps as far as Boston Harbor, before turning east and back to England. John Cabot and his fleet did not return from their second expedition nothing is known of what happened to them. 
Over 100 years would pass before any new interest in or information about the new world would emerge. So we leap ahead to the year 1605. You may be surprised to know that fishermen had frequented the coast, including Boston Bay, for years prior to what historians tell us was the discovery of this place. These fishermen traded with the Indians somewhat and on the whole maintained a friendly relationship. One of the first estimates of Indians, although probably greatly exaggerated, is that made by Sir Desmond, who anchored his little ship off the Winthrop shore near Noodles Island in 1605. Desmond asserted that Boston was the center of a vast Indian population numbering between 150,000 and 200,000 souls, he said. He also said that around about the harbor, some 30,000 fighting men were busy carrying fire and massacre into the villages of neighboring tribes. They also stood ready to repel any attempt at settlement. The Indians, he reported, lived in villages of bark houses each large enough to shelter 30 or 40 persons with the entire village fortified by a stout palisade of logs. Desmond spoke particularly about the islands in the harbor, saying that they were occupied by Indian villages surrounded by fields of corn, beans, squash, and tobacco. Great fleets of canoes swarmed out of the various inlets of the harbor to examine the little ship. Timon and the French admiral, awed by the display of Indian might, decided that fair and rich as Boston was, it could not be settled in the face of this fierce Indian opposition. So he turned north and settled the French in Arcadia. Captain John Smith, the great English adventurer, when he visited New England in 1614 and again in 1615, sent a report to his financial backers of Boston and vicinity. And in it he said, the country is the paradise of these parts. The seacoast as you pass shows you all along large cornfields and great troops of well-proportioned people. He said, we found the people in these parts kindly, but in their fury, no less valiant. A year later, a French trading vessel anchored off of Lovell's Island. A war party attacked the ship and killed the crew with the exception of four men who were taken from one Indian village to the next and exhibited to the curiosity of the Indians. The fate of the four is not known, but I'm sure it's not good. It is believed that this attack was in retaliation for a raid by Captain Hunt in 1614. Hunt, who stayed here when John Smith returned to England, seized about 20 Indians and took them to Spain, where he sold them into slavery. Had the Pilgrims in Plymouth or the Puritans under John Winthrop in Boston attempted settlement during this first decade of the 1600s, the fate of the Plymouth and Boston colonies might have been very different. It is doubtful that the Indians of eastern Massachusetts would have allowed white men to peaceably settle there. So what happened in the few short years to change all of that? In the years 1617 and 1618, a fierce epidemic swept through the Indian villages. It was a European disease, mostly smallpox, it is said. It is believed that the Indians got the disease from some European fishermen or sailors. In any event, the Indians were nearly wiped out of existence. The remaining few suffered further destruction at the hands of a very fierce tribe of Indians from Maine, the Tarentines. 
The Tarentines and the Massachusetts tribe were, traditional, were traditional enemies. The Tarentines swept down and completed the ruin of the, this once very powerful Indian tribe, particularly those along the coast of Massachusetts. Prior to the epidemics, Winthrop was certainly one of the choice Indian neighborhoods. Nevertheless, there are no written records of any battles here. We do know that the Indians lived here, perhaps all year long, but most certainly in the summer months. Coastal Indians commonly established two residences. During the summer months, they lived at the shore where they lived on fish, clams, and lobster. Mm, sounds very good, doesn't it? In the fall, they returned inland, harvested the crops they had planted in the spring, and then settled down in the forest to live the cold months away with the help of preserved food and wild game. When spring returned, they planted their gardens and left once more for the seashore. Winthrop undoubtedly was one such resort. For some of our knowledge of the Winthrop Indians, we are indebted to a man named Sidvin Frank Tucker, custodian of the town museum in the Winthrop Public Library. Sidvin was the man who many years ago collected and preserved Indian artifacts. One of Winthrop's outstanding Indian discoveries was made in 1888 when under the direction of town engineer Channing Howard, Indian graves were uncovered while grading was in progress for the construction of the Boston, Revere Beach and Lynn Railroad. The site was at the platform of the center station where Jefferson Street runs into Woodside Avenue. We now call the place French Square. A Harry Wharf, then a boy recently brought to Winthrop by his family, was intensely interested and joined Mr. Howard in photographing the graves. Each grave was about three feet deep. Skeletons of men, women, and children were found along with some pottery, arrowheads, and stone tools. Examination of the remains suggested that one Indian may have been murdered. An arrowhead was found embedded in his spine. The materials were turned over to the Peabody Museum at Harvard for preservation. Sometime later, another skeleton was found when the foundation was dug for the E.B. Newton, Newton School on Pauline Street. Also of interest is an old deed in the town which gave as one boundary the old Indian fort. Mr. Clark reports its location as being where the present Baptist church is located. I believe that is where our present United Methodist Church is, but I'm not sure. Benjamin Shirtliff, in his writings, describes the Indians of this region. He says, in their person, the Indians were from five to six feet in height, of reddish and pleasant complexion with black hair and black eyes. Their whole form was a model of strength and activity, he says. They oiled their bodies with the fat of bears and eagles and tied their hair in a lock on the top of their head, frequently with a snakeskin. Arthur William H. Clark, in his history of Winthrop, tells us that their clothing was chiefly a matter of the weather. In summer and indoors, when the huts were warm enough, commonly nothing at all was worn. Usually, however, both men and women wore a sort of breech garment as the foundation of their apparel. These pants were made of various animal materials, such as buckskin, tanned until soft and pliable. When going into the woods for hunting, the men wore leather leggings to protect their shins. These, as with most tan garments, were painted with geometric designs in blue and red and yellow. On their feet, men and women usually wore the Indian moccasins. The style of these varied from tribe to tribe. 
In warm weather, the moccasins were low cut, but in the winter, they were higher. When the weather was cold, the Indians simply draped the upper part of their bodies with a robe-like wrap made of fur. These robes hung about the shoulders and were belted at the waist. Raccoon skins were highly prized for these robes, and wildcat was also popular. Their weapons were bows, arrows, and tomahawks. Their bows were made of walnut or some other elastic wood and strung with sinews of deer and moose. Their arrows were made of elder and feathered with the quills of eagles. They were headed with a long, sharp stone tied to a short stick, which was thrust into the pith of the elder. Their tomahawks were made of a flat stone sharpened to an edge with a groove in the middle. This was inserted in a bent walnut stick, that the ends of which were tied together. The Indians subsisted by hunting, fishing, and farming. Their farming skills were pretty much confined to the cultivation of corn, beans, pumpkins, and squash, which were all indigenous plants. Of course, there was a wide variety of wild fruits and berries to harvest as well. Their women performed all the labor of agriculture and hoed the corn with large clamshells. Corn was an important crop to the Indians. When boiled in kernels, it was called samp. When parched and pounded for journeys, it was termed noki hike and when pounded and boiled, it was called hominy. They also boiled corn and beans together, which they called succotash. Sounds familiar. Berries were plenty, especially strawberries, very large ones, sometimes two inches around. And these were bruised in a mortar, and mixing them with corn made strawberry bread. Whortleberries were also employed in the same manner. As I can do a food show, huh? Indian houses or wigwams were rude structures made of poles set around in the form of a cone and covered with bark and mats. They were moved about by the woman to hunting, fishing, and planting grounds. In winter, one great house built with more care stirred for the accommodation of many. The Indians had two kinds of boats, called canoes, of course. The one made of a pine log 20 to 60 feet in length, burned and scraped out with shells. The other made of birch bark, very light and elegant. They made fishing lines of wild hemp, equal to the finest twine, and used fish bones for hooks. Their method of catching deer was by making two fences of trees nearly a mile in length in the form of an angle with a snare at the place of meeting in which they frequently took the deer alive. The Indians of this area appear to have been very fond of amusement as well. The tribes, even from a great distance, were accustomed to challenging each other and to assemble upon uh, Lynn Beach to decide their contest. Here they sometimes pass many days in the exercise of running, leaping, shooting, and other diversions. A tall pole was planted in the beach on which were hung beaver skins, money, and ornaments for which they contended. And frequently all they were worth was ventured in the play. One of their principal sports was football. The ball was not larger than a handball, which they caused to fly in the air with their naked feet. The idea was to keep the ball in the air. They had another game called Puum, which was played by shuffling together 50 or 60 short sticks and contending for them. Don't understand that one. Another game was played with five flat pieces of bone, black on one side and white on another. These were put into a wooden dish which was struck on the ground, causing the bones to bound aloft, and as they fell white or black, the game was decided. That sounds like gambling to me. 
The money was made of shells gathered on the beaches and was of two kinds which differed in value. One was called wampum pie, or white money, and the other called sakahook, or black money. These shells were also made into pendants, bracelets, and belts of wampum, some carved with the figures of animals and flowers. On their arrival in Plymouth in 1620 and in Boston in 1629, both the pilgrims and Puritans alike reported that the red people received the immigrants in a friendly manner. The Indians taught them how to plant, and when any of the settlers traveled through the woods, they were their guides and often went 10 or even 20 miles to conduct them on their way. That was good, but we, we know today that as the years went along and settlements increased, these warm feelings would go away. The Indians had religion, but what we might call a primitive kind of worship. The principal power or priest was Passaconaway, who resided in Pentucket or Averill. They believed that after death they should go to the region whence come the pleasant southwest wind where dwelt their great and benevolent God, coat unto it, and where they should enjoy perpetual pleasures in hunting and fishing without weariness. The Indians cultivated a kind of natural music and modulated their voices by the sound of birds. They had war and death songs and lullabies to quiet their children. The Winthrop Indians at about the time of the pestilence were under the chieftainship of Nana Pashanet. We learn from biographies and legends of the New England Indians authored by Leo Bonifanti in 1971 that Nana Pashanet, meaning the new moon, ruled over a federation of tribes known as the Massachusetts. As a result of a dangerous war with the Tarentines in 1616, Nana Pashamet was forced to live in constant fear for his own life. He abandoned his coastal lodges going inland to Medford along the shores of the Mystic River. He built several fortresses to which he could retreat in the first sign of danger. One of these was on the top of a hill and the house was built on a platform that was six feet from the ground. Pointed stakes were driven into the ground as close together as possible. These stakes were between 30 and 40 feet long and formed a circle almost 50 feet in diameter. It was necessary to cross a moat and climb over the palisade with a ladder, which was retrieved when Nana Pashamet was freely inside. As Nana Pashamet had feared, the Tarentines at last found his hideout. A large war party was sent out in 1619, which successfully stormed the fortress and killed the great Sachin. Prior to the imminent attack, Nana Pashamet sent his wife and four children inland where they were protected by a friendly tribe. When it seemed that the danger had passed, she returned to Medford where she assumed the cloak of authority that had once been her husband's. Although she lost a number of the Massachusetts Federation tribes, three remained loyal to the Squaw Sachem, the Nomkegs, the Saugus, and the Winnesimits and she placed her three sons to rule over them. The new federation was also called the Massachusetts and she was known to us only as the Squaw Sachem of Massachusetts. In 1667, she suffered a stroke that left her completely paralyzed and she soon died. Of her three sons, Munahakwahan was the oldest and became Sachem of the Winnesimit whose lands included Charlestown, Revere, Winthrop, and Chelsea. The English settlers liked this tall, handsome, agreeable Indian, and they called him Sagamore John. He became a Christian and consented to be ruled by the same laws that governed the English, availing himself of the court's justice on a number of occasions. In 1632, Wuna Hakraham found that the settlers were becoming too numerous and they were encroaching on his lands. 
He went to court constantly in an effort to have these disputes settled peaceably, yet a majority of his claims were never brought to trial. The problem was eventually overcome when the smallpox epidemic killed almost all the Massachusetts Indians in 1633. On December 5, 1633, Wunahakwaham fell victim to this disease. Nobody knows for sure where Sagamore John was buried. The best guess is that he was buried in Charlestown, along with 30 other Indians who died on the same day. It is also believed by some that he is now resting on what we call Admiral's Hill in Chelsea. Sagamore James, who took over after John's death, was much less friendly to the settlers. It is said that James led an attack upon Samuel Maverick's farm in Chelsea. James did not like the English at all, but his animosity did not amount to much because he too died shortly after John's death. Sagamore George then took over the reins of government and soon began to make trouble for the settlers at Romney Marsh, Revere, and at Pullen Point. You know where that is. Being comparatively well-educated, he substituted the courts for his tomahawk, and for 10 years, he kept the settlers in an anxious state. George contended that the settlers held their land by illegal title. He brought suit after suit in the lower courts and filed petition after petition in the general court. These were all eventually dismissed, but at the time, the legality of the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony itself was in question in the English Parliament. The settlers at Pullen Point, to settle the case, gave in to Sagamore George and purchased their land from him for trifles on June 4, 1865. Soon afterward, the suit was dismissed in the British courts, and the validity of the Massachusetts Bay Charter was affirmed. So the Pullen Point settlers once again received new titles to their lands from the colony, and so rested secure. Of great historic note to the people of Winthrop is the fact that on March 19, 1685, David Nanumpanohau, I think that's how it's pronounced, <laughs> The grandson of Sagamore George signed a deed giving Deer Island to Boston. I wonder what this island would look like today if David had sold the island to the settlers in Winthrop. Well, so now you know something of the Indians of Winthrop. In our next program, we'll be discussing the praying Indians of Deer Island. I hope you will join us then. Peace.